From time to time, people will ask me, Jeff, how's your model railroad coming along? Because many people will assume that, uh, you know, a year into a pandemic, that I might have been free to get all sorts of work done. But alas, like this locomotive, there has been a lot of dust collected. That's a picture of about half the layout that you can see there. It's a pretty pathetic degree of progress. It really uh, looks like nothing better than the Plywood Pacific at this point. Some of you will remember that a few years ago the Board of Managers decided to replace the windows in the basement of the manse and they thought, oh, well, we'll just be able to work around the layout. And I said, oh, no, you won't. (laughs) But I was happy to dismantle it because... I had built it originally with two duck-unders in it, and I'm just too old for duck-unders anymore. So I thought this will be an occasion to be able to rebuild it in a manner that is more old preacher friendly. So that is where we're at with that. But really, I haven't got a great deal done, largely because when the pandemic hit... The need to pivot the church from analog to digital took a lot of my free time. Very often I will say that my model railroad is a patient mistress. It never complains about the lack of attention that it gets. And model railroading is a cherished hobby for me, but some days, well, a lot of days, I just don't have the enthusiasm for it that I'd like to have. But that's the great thing about a hobby, right? It's a pastime. It can wait. It isn't going to complain. It'll just sit there until I do something with it. Sadly, though, I fear some people may treat their faith in the same manner. It can be seen as a pastime, an add-on, a hobby that will wait patiently while we pursue other interests. The trouble is, that's not what the Christian faith is about. The Christian faith is not a hobby. Occasionally, someone will say to me about themselves or another person, you know, that they they will refer to themselves as a non-practicing Presbyterian, Roman Catholic, Baptist, Anglican, United Church, whatever. And my usual response is, uh, you can't get good at it if you don't practice. And I could say that too about other kinds of hobbies like playing the piano or cross-country skiing or lifting weights. But none of that makes any sense because someone who doesn't practice the piano is never going to get any better at it. Somebody who only dabbles in cross-country skiing will find that sore muscles and falling over tend to be characterizing their outings. And somebody who only lifts weights from time to time is never going to win a strong man or strong woman competition. Even though those are hobbies, they can be lifestyle choices, I suppose, but they certainly cannot envelop all of one's life. And if they did, those folks would probably make for fairly crummy conversationalists at a dinner party. No, lifestyle choices are deeper than that. They envelop all of life. And faith is a lifestyle choice. It is a habit, not a hobby. One of the challenges that we face in the church as we become a marginalized minority in society is that many people have been used to having faith as a hobby and found that that was quite acceptable in culture but because now they're finding that it is less acceptable in culture than it used to be, they are setting it aside in favor of something else. And as a result, churches are dying across the Western world at an unprecedented rate. The reality is your faith is a habit, not a hobby. And if you're to make your faith a habit, it takes a lot of practice. The Apostle Paul, same guy who wrote Romans, same guy who wrote Ephesians, what we looked at last week, uh, wrote a letter to the Colossians, to the church at Colossae in the first century. This was a church that was planted by Paul's helper, Epaphras, and Paul learned that that church was being bombarded by what he called a philosophy, some sort of teaching, it wasn't quite clear, that was based in human tradition, and it was proving to be unhelpful in their growth in Christ. 
In chapter 2 of Colossians, Paul announces that the people have been set free from the power that touted that philosophy. And in chapter 3, he says that they have been set free to live a life above moral reproach. He gives a list of vices and virtues in chapter 3 later on. Uh, Not to suggest that the Christian faith is a list of do's and don'ts, but to help them understand that the practice of the Christian faith is not a hobby, something that they might dabble in from time to time, but a habit, a lifestyle that they live out to the glory of God. And because we live in a culture that looks a lot like what we heard from Uh, what was read from Isaiah 6 earlier, it has become easy to stop dabbling in something that our hearts just aren't committed to. But if the church is going to be what God wants it to be as we progress beyond the pandemic and into the new world that contains we know not what, we need to get a grip on what it means to live out our faith as a habit and not as a hobby as a lifestyle, and not as an add-on. So we're going to look at Colossians 3, 1 to 17. We'll see what directives God is giving to us through the Apostle Paul's words to the church that meets there. Since you have been raised to new life with Christ, set your sights on the realities of heaven where Christ sits in the place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. Let's just pause there for a minute. Paul is writing to believers here, people who are the church, with the assumption that they have been raised to new life in Jesus Christ, and he's calling them and us to set our sights on the realities of heaven. How many of us think much about heaven other than to sentimentalize about grandpa playing the banjo for St. Peter or that child taken too soon sitting on Jesus' lap? There is much more to heaven than this, and we understand a mere sliver of it, right? But he'll say more about that as we go on. He says, our real life is hidden with Christ in God. That means our eternity is sealed. No uh, menacing powers can bring us to ultimate harm, so we don't need to placate whatever powers there may be by caving into their lifestyle. And likewise, we can't let the fact that the Lord has His grip on us so tightly bring down our guard. Verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, is revealed to the whole world, you will share in all His glory. Christ, who is your life. One church I served, I had barely gotten to know the people. I guess guess I'd perhaps been there a year when one of the elders died. And as I did when I arrived here, I, I asked everybody to fill out a little questionnaire so that I could get to know them kind of on paper originally. And when I put, what does this church mean to you, this one elder whose funeral I was conducting, he wrote this. He said, it has been my life. And that was the title of the message I used at his funeral. It has been my life. When your faith in Jesus Christ is what you are best known for, that's when you've got it figured out as a habit and not a hobby. Christ who is your life is not an add-on. When He comes to establish His kingdom, it will be made clear why all the centering of life around Jesus is the way to go. So what's Paul's advice? Verse 5. So put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within you. With an eye to chapter 2 verse 13 and chapter 3 verse 5, Paul says that you're either dead in sin or you're dead to sin. 
But even if you're dead to sin, as I am, you're still a work in progress. Then he begins this list of vices to eschew. Have nothing to do with sexual immorality, which involves, by the way, the whole gamut of sexual sins, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Now, I I must say this. Remember that sexual desire is God's idea. It's good. The key is to channel it and direct it according to your new life in Jesus. Don't be greedy. And when he says greedy here, he's not just referring to money, but anything that makes us think that the world revolves around us. Which is why he then says, for a greedy person is an idolater worshiping the things of this world. You know how the culture of the world tells us to trust our hearts? You see that in some of the prettiest memes on social media. Just Go with your heart. My old pal John Calvin, he should be your old pal too, by the way. Calvin said that the human heart is nothing more than a perpetual idol factory. Verse 6, Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things when your life was still part of this world, but now is the time to get rid of anger. That's chronic anger. Rage, that's those little outbursts. Uh, Malicious behavior, slander. And then he says dirty language, which doesn't mean just swearing, but anything that one might say to hurt other people. Don't lie to each other, for you have stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Adlai Stevenson was a U.S. senator and one-time American presidential candidate, and he said this quite famously. He said, A lie is an abomination unto the Lord and a very present help in trouble. See, we often treat these little white lies with kit gloves, but lying is serious sin. And the reality is, if we're honest with ourselves, we know it, right? When we lie to somebody, we feel it right then and there if we have any kind of conscience or especially if we have the Holy Spirit living in us. Verse 10, put on your new nature. See, he's talking about being stripped down and redressed again. Put on your new nature and be renewed, that is continually renewed, as you learn to know your Creator and become like Him. It's like a change of clothes. But did, did you notice that the emphasis we see on, on sexual sin in the Bible, that here we are shown that it is put on the same plane as lying. That's how bad they all are. All sin matters. And we must remove it in order to know God and be more like Him. In this new life, it doesn't matter if you are a Jew or a Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbaric, that is referring to people from other lands who spoke some sort of gibberish as far as the Greeks were concerned, Uh, uncivilized, slave or free. Christ is all that matters and He lives in all of us. So, Religious background doesn't matter. Cultural background doesn't matter. Economic background doesn't matter. When we put on Christ, we become, as 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, new creations. The old is gone and the new has come. Or as it says in 1 Peter 2 verse 10, we who were, no, we who were not a people at all, have become the people of God. And now he gives some directives for being the church as a redeemed people, beginning in verse 12. He says, Since God chose you to be the holy people He loves, you must clothe yourselves with tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Do you see the parallels there with the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5? Make allowance for each other's faults, And forgive anyone who offends you. Remember, the Lord forgave you, so you must forgive others. Now some will say, oh yeah, that's different, but is it? Remember that forgiving an offense doesn't mean the offense didn't happen. 
or that there shouldn't be consequences for the offense. What it means when you forgive someone is that you are set free from any bondage that that offense has brought and you are set free from the offender. Above all, he says, clothe yourselves with love which binds us all together in perfect harmony and let the peace that comes from Christ rule in your hearts. For as members of one body, you are called to live in peace and always be thankful. Let the message about Christ in all its richness fill your lives. Teach and counsel each other with all the wisdom he gives. Sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God with thankful hearts. And whatever you do or say, do it as a representative of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through Him to God the Father. All those mentions in there of the Lord Jesus Christ indicate that it is Him, in Him alone, that we have our new identity. But this new identity isn't like being in the witness protection program, right? I I don't know if you've ever been, I I, I suppose I shouldn't know if you've ever been in the witness protection program. I I myself have not. I have, however, been in the fitness protection program. Um, But in the witness protection program, for your own safety, after you testify against a criminal, you could be given a new name, a new identity, you could be shipped off to live in a new community, But you're still you, no matter what the authorities may do to your driver's license or your get-up or your face. The real you does not change. But when you become a follower of Jesus Christ, it's different. The real you does change. If someone is dissatisfied with his or her marriage, the spouse could be sent for a makeover, but that would still be the same person, maybe in different clothes or different size or different hair or different makeup, but still the same person because a makeover cannot change the heart. Prayer and counseling and therapy can help, but new duds ain't going to cut it. If you're not happy with how your car is performing, taking it to the paint shop is not going to make it run any better. But if you take your Ford Focus to the shop and have a Carroll Shelby 351 Windsor dropped into it, you might notice a bit of change in performance. See, becoming a follower of Jesus is more like a heart transplant or an engine transplant than a makeover or a paint job. Your faith is a habit, not a hobby. But here's a better analogy yet. If you were doing some renovations in your house and you were tearing down drywall or plaster or whatever and you found that the wooden structure of the house had been badly invaded by termites, would your solution be just to put the drywall back up or put up new drywall and paint and light fixtures and put the furniture in? No, because you know that if you did that, Sooner or later, the house is going to fall down because it will cease to be structurally sound. Friends, the sin in your life and in my life is like termite damage to the house. We can't fix it by covering it up, we can't fix it by trying harder. We can't fix it by going to confession and then doing it again, all again next week. One scholar has said that new life doesn't come as a result of the successful battle with temptation. New life is the starting point. All the behavior modification in the world isn't going to change our standing as sinners. It's about reclaiming your calling. It's about being who you already are in Jesus Christ. It's not to thine own self be true, but to your new self be true. We have to exchange our whole nature, not just revamp it. No conference is going to cure the sinful nature. No weekend retreat is going to save you from sin. We have to Let Jesus Christ exterminate 
the old way of life like we would exterminate termites and replace those damaged studs and joists and beams and rafters. By following Paul's directives to the Colossians, we can see that happen with new results. As Paul says in verse 5, we have to put to death the sinful earthly things lurking within us. Sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, greed, anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, dirty language. And we have to put on our new nature, characterized by tender-hearted mercy, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, forgiveness, love, and the peace of Christ. When we invite the Holy Spirit to live in us through faith, we take on a new nature, new characteristics, and new habits. It isn't a list of do's and don'ts, right? We can't confuse being moral with being Christian, but we cannot claim to be Christian without morality. Let me say that again. We can't confuse being moral with being Christian, but we cannot, com- we cannot claim to be Christian without morality. See, it's possible to be a moral person without Jesus. There's all kinds of people you know and I know who are very nice, good, moral people. But they do not know the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not possible to follow Jesus, however, without also being moral. That is our response to the grace of God at work in our lives. It takes practice to walk the talk, and it's habitual. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in The Cost of Discipleship wrote that it is only those who believe who are obedient, and only those who are obedient who believe. Your faith is a habit, not a hobby. For it to be meaningful, it must be a lifestyle and not a pastime. That's what discipleship is. It's not enough for followers of Jesus to be good, church-going people. We need to be disciples of Jesus, sitting daily at the feet of our Master, learning from Him. Being disciples is the only way to reclaim our calling, a calling that God never lost sight of, even if we did for a time. So what can you do about this? Well, as I've been known to say, quoting Robert Mulholland, spiritual formation is a process of being conformed to the image of Christ for the sake of others. To reclaim our calling, we must let the Lord do His work in our hearts and change us from the inside out. Instead of us getting a makeover... We need to let the Lord do a heart transplant. Instead of painting our little Ford Focus, we need to Lord, let the Lord drop the Shelby in it. Instead of covering up termite damage with drywall, we need to let the Lord replace the studs and the beams and the joists and the rafters. The work of spiritual formation is God's work in us. He invites us to cooperate with Him in the process. So here's what you can do to reclaim your calling. First, confess your sin before God. Acknowledge that you cannot reform yourself. Humbly tell God, even though He already knows every detail of our lives, exactly what you've done that's caused that termite damage in your life. Receive His forgiveness, which He offers you abundantly through the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. Name Jesus as your Savior for all the, from all the sin that you have committed or ever will commit. Name Jesus as Lord of your life so that you can let Him do His transforming work in you, making you into His image. And then pledge to read His Word so that you can be equipped to grow in your faith as a habit and not as a hobby. And join a Life Connect group to make that happen because that's a way to study together in, in a group that will really encourage you together in faith. Center your life around your relationship with God. 
Remember, this life is like a rehearsal for eternity, right? And your relationship with the Lord is going to loom large in eternity. Heaven's not going to be like the far side cartoon with the dude in the angel wings sitting on a cloud saying he wished he'd brought a magazine. That's not what it's going to be like. It's going to be full-on praise of the God who made you, who in Jesus Christ has saved you, and who by the Holy Spirit is in the process of making you more like Jesus today. Be a willing partner in that process by making your faith a habit and not just a hobby. You might have been going to church your whole life and this could be news to you. Maybe you've been thinking, you know, I can just do my life on my own with a little help from the man upstairs. But now, maybe you are realizing that it's not not you who need God's help, perhaps as much as it is God who wants your help. Oh, God can transform you in an instant, in the twinkling of an eye, all by Himself. But would you own that kind of transformation? God invites your partnership in the process of forming you into the image of Jesus. So ask yourself, this is such an important question, am I more like Jesus today than I was yesterday? Am I partnering with God in this work of transformation? Am I reclaiming my calling as a follower of Jesus and not just as a religious spectator? Your faith is a habit, not a hobby. So make it a lifestyle choice. Make Jesus the center of your life. 